Let us, let us stand together and read from God's word, Matthew's, I'm sorry, Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel, chapter 4, starting with verse 2, and I apologize, I did not look up the page number in your paper pew Bibles, but Mark is the second gospel, Matthew, Mark, chapter 4, starting in verse 2. And we're just going to read the first section of this and then pray. And he, that is Jesus, was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Indeed, Father, give us the ears that we need. Chisel out the hardness in our ears so that we can truly hear your word. And I know that your spirit can do that and that it's a miracle that we can hear your word and respond, that we can be hearers and doers. So we pray that in each person here today, you would be tilling up good soil and uh, give us eyes to see what you have before us and what you're calling us to and hearts that are soft and ready to respond. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I can recall the first time I ever saw a tree uprooted. I was four or five years old. We were living in southern Virginia. And yes, I did talk like this, and I can remember when I moved back to Illinois, people said, you talk funny. I can remember the tree in our front yard. We had left the house. There was a storm, and we came back, and I was shocked that the tree had been uprooted, knocked over. It was a huge tree. I couldn't tell you what it was, and it may not have been that big, but you know when you're a little kid, everything seems bigger. So the huge tree in front of the house didn't hit the house, thankfully, but it collapsed, uprooted. And at some point, I had a discussion with my parents, and I asked them, well, how? I mean, the, the tree was huge. It had all this strength and beauty. How, how did it fall? And they taught me about roots. The tree was old, if I remember correctly, and so the roots had begun to rot away and were no longer strong enough to withhold the storm. And as a little kid, you know, I, I don't think I ever thought about what was beneath the surface. I saw the tree above the surface, and I thought, wow, it's beautiful and powerful, and the birds nest there, etc., but I'd never thought about the roots. I'd never thought about what I could not see with my own eyes. I never thought about the roots. Today we're going to begin a series, a 12-week series on roots. And by roots, I mean doctrine, by what we believe. This is going to be a new series for me to preach. I've never done a series like this, per se. I've taught through classes on doctrine, that is, what we believe but I really felt compelled to help us as a congregation make sure that our roots are deep and healthy. So we'll begin a 12-week series covering the 10 foundations of the Evangelical Free Church. Any member here or elder or pastor has committed to believe and to follow the 10, if you will, roots or articles of faith that incorporate the Evangelical Free Church of America, which we are a part of. We're going to walk through these. This will be a different sermon series. It won't be just one passage. Um, I'm going to try to keep it on the shorter side. Uh, That'll be hard uh, for me, so you can pray that I don't put you to sleep after an hour-long sermon. Um, But we're going to walk through this carefully because as your pastor and one of your elders, I'm deeply concerned that we as a culture and as the church in North America, we have erred on the side of being a mile wide and an inch deep. And we see in vast numbers men or women and children who identified as Christian but walk away come college or later. And I have to wonder if part of it is because we've not fed those roots deeply in God's word. 
and we've given in, perhaps, as well to the American gospel. That is a, a prosperity gospel that says God wants to bless you and make you healthy and happy and probably rich, too. And when storms come through, any type of faith that that's, that's so shallow, your, your tree gets blown over like the one in my front yard in a little town in Virginia outside of Danville. So, thus we begin with Mark's parable. And let's turn back to that first slide, Jeff. Mark's parable sets an example of what we're talking about with roots. It's interesting, this is Jesus' first recorded parable in Mark. So Jesus has been born, he's been baptized, he's suffered in the desert 30 days of temptation, and he's just starting his ministry, and he's got his boat parked at the Sea of Galilee there, if I'm not mistaken, and his first parable is about soil, seed, and whether they take root. So we just read it. I'm going to walk through it real quick in case it was a little confusing or you, or you haven't heard it for a while. A sower, that is a farmer, goes out to sow what? Well, he sows seed, not with the tractor, but by hand. So the farmer is out tossing seed. Seed falls where it might. And Jesus then describes four soils that the seed falls into. The first is the path, right? And as he sowed, verse 4, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Didn't even get a chance to try to set roots. The birds said, yummy. The next seed falls on the rocky ground, right? Which did not have much soil, so the seed could not set root. The third soil type the seed falls into is choked out by thorns, and thus it cannot grow, it withers and dies. But the fourth soil The most important soil in the parable is the soil that is tilled and ready, and that seed goes in, and it bears abundant fruit. Friends, that's my prayer for each one of us, that our hearts, to extend the metaphor, are like well-plowed and tilled ground, and so that God's word comes in, and it bears fruit. And here, Jesus is talking about fruit unto salvation, Again, the idea is of the four soils, only one will be welcomed, well done, good and faithful servant. The other three, their faith, whatever it was, however shallow it was, fell away. Whether it was hard times or struggles, culture pressure or whatever. So as your pastor, one of your pastors and one of your elders, I love you and I care and I want your roots to be deep enough to withstand whatever the world and the devil throw at you. <clears throat> well, Jesus expands this in verse 10 and just kind of explains it real quick to his disciples because they're concerned. They've been following him for a little bit. He's called them. They didn't choose him. He chose them. And he, when he was alone, they ask him. And he says in verse 11, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Jesus is quoting Isaiah. And he said to them, do you understand the parable? Well, then how are you going to understand all the rest of the parables? The sower sows the word, God's word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. Right? And now he goes back through the soils. When they hear, Satan immediately on the path comes and takes away the word that has sown them. Verse 16. And these are the ones sown on the rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root in themselves. It says in verse 17, and they immediately, they fall away. Verse 18, and others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So those that were sown in the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Wow. First parable. Jesus doesn't mess around. He uses the agricultural terms that they're all familiar with, and he really gets his disciples and the followers and the crowds thinking about what this parable means and where they see themselves. So, if you see yourselves in maybe one of those other soils, not that fourth one, but you're, you're struggling with your faith or you're struggling to, what is this Christianity? This is a great series for you. 
This is the perfect series for you. Come, explore. Ask the questions. Dig into God's word with us. Come as you are. Come as you are and explore what God says about himself and why it is so important that it's, well, been changing history ever since. So again, we're walking through 12 weeks through the EFCA Statement of Faith. <clears throat> what is doctrine? Doctrine is beliefs, but belief may not be quite as strong a term. A doctrine is a belief that's very deeply held, and in the context of faith, it is a belief about what the scriptures teach. It's a conviction, deeply held, not easily uprooted, and they're publicly stated. Our doctrinal statement is on our website. It's something we publicly state and we teach. It summarizes what the Bible says. It summarizes systematically or orderly what the scriptures teach. If you've been with us since I've started preaching, you know I like to preach through books of the Bible, but the hard thing about that is you don't get the full picture of certain things in scriptures. You don't get the systematic big picture. It's good to walk through the word and let it set the agenda, but sometimes we need to step back and say, well, what does the whole scripture say about sin or salvation or heaven or hell, etc.? That's what the Evangelical Free Church Statement of Faith intends to do, and it intends to equip us with those ten strong roots. There's been a trend, as I've said, over the past, I'd say, hundred years or so to downplay doctrine, to not really talk about it or to see it as maybe even divisive. But friends, if doctrine is simply deeply held beliefs about what God words, God's word teaches, then our doctrine is incredibly valuable. What we believe about the word is incredibly valuable. And it's shown in that parable. What do we believe about the word? Will it bear fruit a hundredfold? Or will our faith wither? Yes, doctrine can divide. But what we believe has the potential to not only divide, but also to heal and bring eternal life. There are hard things that the scriptures teach, and on a given Sunday, I may not cover that question that you have regarding who is God or who is Jesus. So, again, using your little communication card, I would love to know what you have a question about. If it's even in the middle of your sermon, just grab your pen, write it down. Pastor Kevin, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Let me know. Let me know, because I won't have time to cover nearly all of my own questions, let alone what all of us might be thinking. We need doctrine, friends, to be disciples. We need to know what the scriptures say to be disciples. It is not enough to just follow the Spirit without being rooted in the word that Jesus sent him to reveal, John 14 through 17. We need the word, and we need to be deeply rooted in it. Well, the doctrine of God is where we begin today properly. Our first, we'll divide it into two sections. Today, we're going to just talk about who God is, that he has created, and that he has a plan of redemption. Just those three things. Who God is, that he has created all things, and that he has a plan of redemption. Each one of those could be easily a separate sermon. So I am going to skim by some things, and again, Write down a note. Let me know what you're thinking about. Let me know what has been a struggle to your faith or a question that you've had. I would love to get back to those because odds are your question is somebody else's question. Let's pull up Article 1 on our Statement of Faith. And here it is. We believe in one God, creator of all things, holy, infinitely perfect, and eternally existing in a loving unity of three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Having limitless knowledge and sovereign power, God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself and to make all things new for his own glory. That's a lot. You can see why I've broken it up into two Sundays. Today we're going to focus on the highlighted section in this next slide. We believe in the one God, creator of all things. Next slide. God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself and to make all things new for his own glory. Compactly, we believe in one God, the creator of all things, who has graciously purposed to redeem 
and to make all things new for his glory. Genesis chapter 1. Open your Bibles, please. Genesis chapter 1. It's the only time I can say page 1 because everybody's Bibles will, you see what I did there? Yeah, everybody's on page 1. All right, drink more coffee. Obviously, we need to wake up a little bit. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, let's just pause right there. In the beginning, God. This probably is the most quoted verse in our Bible. And because our Jewish friends share the Old Testament of the Bible, they too quote this scripture. And it's referenced all over the place. Right? It's referenced all over the place in lots of different contexts. In the beginning, God. So before there was anything else, there was God. It doesn't say things were created and then God made them better. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So from this, we draw, among other scriptures, that God has always existed. He has never not existed. And in fact, our word for existence is actually limited. The Latin root means to be birthed or made from something else. Right? So children exist because of the love of their parents and the fruit of their womb. But God doesn't exist in that way because he was not made from anything else. He's always been. So even our language has a hard time kind of wrapping our minds around the fact that God is, has, and always will be all in one. In fact, the Hebrew personal name of God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament, the covenant name that God only shares with his people, roughly translated is I am that I am. Not I exist, because he didn't have to exist from something else. He's always been. This is our God. This is our God. In the beginning, God. So, since God has always been, therefore, he is eternal, and therefore, he created time. And I know this is a little mind-blowing for some of us and others. We've thought about this, and we're, we're loving it, and it's good to be reminded, but just follow the argument here, follow the logic. God has existed, God is, and always has been, and then he creates, and he creates everything, including time. So our God, even now, exists outside of time. And I like to think of it in, you know, objects, if you will. If, if this is creation, God's out here looking. And he can see past, present, future, because he created time. Now, I don't know how. No clue. No clue. There's been theories, etc. No idea how that works. I look forward to hearing from himself. God, how does this work? No idea. But he has always existed. He exists outside of time. Therefore, he is able to see you before you're born, during your life, and to know what is next. And therefore, we take a hope in his call. For he's not bound like we are. And this gets into the holiness of God, the otherness of God. He is so different than us. It is, if we're honest, a huge stretch, isn't it? I can't imagine God because he doesn't fit into any of the categories that pre-exist in my mind. Because, because I look at creation and it is only a faint echo of the creator. God is. Creates time and begins then to create all of creation. Moving on to Genesis, the next part, later in the chapter. We know that God takes six days to create the heavens and the earth. And in the Old Testament language here, this is, a, this is a, a catchphrase for just saying everything. Okay? The heavens and the earth. That contrast, that complement is used often in each day. Moses, in his record of the creation account given to him by God, sets forth six days that God creates. And on the sixth day, the pinnacle of God's creation he creates man. 
Let's read verse 26 together. This is still in chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I'll pause here. We'll develop this a little bit more later, but we get the idea that we are made in the image of God. The imago dei is the Latin term. We are the only part of creation that is a reflection, dimly, of God. Nobody else gets this honor. So, in some fashion, we reflect God, but poorly. And we'll develop that more, not only today, but in the weeks to come. But God, in our image, he created us, male and female. And again, we'll develop this a little bit more later, but intrinsically in the Genesis account, there is always equality between men and women. We are made equally in God's image. There can be complementary natures, but value, equal. End of story. Bigotry, there's no place for it. That Christians in countries like ours have proposed or been proponents of bigotry, seeing men higher than women, is evil, and it's worthy of repentance because it doesn't come from the scriptures. This is not Islam where every man's heaven is a woman's hell. God created man and woman in his image. And after every day, and you know the account, many of you, God always says, and it was good. Wow, it was good. Well, we'll keep reading here. Verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And so it was. And God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. For the first five days, it was good, but it's now magnified. It was good, good, very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day, chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he had rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. But God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Wow, there's a lot there. It was very good. Friends, let's remind ourselves of some, just some very basic truths from Genesis, the start of creation, the start of history, the start of time. Everything God made was good. God did not make evil. Evil is not a substance. Evil is, evil is not an entity. It does not have matter or material. It is the corruption of what is good. Again, this is not to be confused with some Asian beliefs that see evil and good and there's got to be a balance. Frankly, hello Star Wars, right? Okay, I like some of the Star Wars movies. The last ones, uh, whatever. But anyhow, yeah, you're with me? Okay, good. <coughs> Poor George Lucas. But anyhow, I digress. Um, there is nothing that God has created that is evil, okay? Evil is the corruption of good or the desecration of good or the disobedience of what God said to do, okay? And Augustine develops this in a really marvelous way early on in the church to help Christians wrestle with this, who suffer evil. We are, as we all admit, I think if we're honest, very, very, we have a very safe and fat life here in, as Americans, but our brothers and sisters in different countries experience evil in ways that I could see why they might question how a good God could allow their suffering and persecution. God makes everything good. <clears throat> and we are the responsible ones for the rebellion. We are the ones who broke what God had created to be good. So thus our statement of faith <clears throat> reads... We believe in one God, 
And then the next section says, God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people. So something happened. You don't need redemption if something didn't go wrong. You don't need to be saved in the water if you're not drowning. So something happened in between Genesis 2 and chapter Genesis 3. And it's been said the Bible is really the story of God and his good creation, the fall, and then redemption, all the way to Revelation, the end of Revelation. There's part one, part two, and we're in huge part three. <clears throat> but we know that God not only is and therefore eternal, and next week we'll talk about his power and his knowledge and his wisdom and his purity, but we also know he has a plan. He was not surprised by the free will and the choices that we made with it. <clears throat> this won't be up on your screen, but turn to Genesis chapter 3 and read with me. If you don't have your Bibles, just listen closely. Now the serpent <clears throat> was more crafty than any other beast in the field. So in between chapters 1 and 3, God has taken from Adam Eve, made Eve, and Adam is finally has a, a partner. He has one like him, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and it was good. And they are given the duty to have work. Work is not evil, friends. Yeah, heaven isn't just a big, you know, vacation. Work is good. And Adam and Eve now encounter the serpent, which we know from other portions of Scripture to be Satan, a fallen angel who wants to take as many with him as possible. Verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So God creates Adam, lets him uh, name the animals, but he doesn't find an Eve. God makes an Eve for Adam. It's amazing. God says, there's one thing, don't touch that tree. Don't eat from it, don't touch it, or you'll die. All right, sounds pretty simple. Until the serpent says, did he really, did God really say that? You can, if you've had siblings, you've all had this conversation, right? Did dad really say that? Did mom, re I mean, really? We all lawyer things, right? You know, we laugh at it because we've done it, right? We've done it because we have received the brokenness from Adam and Eve, and it's just part of what we know to be a temptation that all of us will fall into. Questioning authority. Picking up in verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, well, you, should, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Wow, what a temptation. You don't have to listen to God. In fact, he told you no because he wants to keep you from something better. Don't you want to be like God? It's been said by others smarter than me that the fundamental root of sin is pride. And we see it here. Don't you want to be like God? Some may say it's the American dream. to be our own little gods, kings over our little fiefdom, unaccountable to anybody. I've got my truth, you've got your truth. Let's not argue about the inconsequential differences. But as I said before, and I'll say again, this is where doctrine does divide, because doctrine represents our beliefs, what the scriptures teach. And in the scriptures, there's only one author and arbiter of truth, and that is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So we can create our little fiefdoms here and build ourselves up to be little gods, but there'll be a day of reckoning and there will be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Well, Eve takes the bait. Verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes, covetousness, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And innocence is lost. 
It's been called the fall by many, many Christians and many writers for centuries. Another author once called it just a, a schism, a, a, a great rend in reality. Now sin has entered. Now disobedience has entered. God gave us free will, and we and Adam and Eve chose to do what was wrong. And lest any of us think that we wouldn't have done the same thing, don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Well, we know the rest of the story. Those of us who have heard this at some level, God punishes the serpent and he punishes Adam and Eve. Okay, the serpent, he predicts the eventual coming of Jesus to destroy the devil. And the woman is cursed with pain in her labor. And the man is cursed with toil in his labor, in the fields and in work. So while work was meant to be good and enjoyable and fulfilling, we all know, man, woman, child, that it is full of toil and hardship and things breaking. Um, certainly that's been part of my week. So we know that we experience this daily. It's part of our commonality as humans, as creatures made in the image of God. Notice one of God's first mercies, in addition to clothing them, by the way, which meant he had to kill animals that he created. He banishes them from the garden. Look at the end of chapter 3 with me if you have your Bibles. <clears throat> the Lord, this is verse 22, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like, like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and obviously his wife, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is a mercy, because God prevented Adam and Eve in their sin from taking from the tree of eternal life and being eternally damned. It's a great mercy. Again, let me repeat that. God kicks them out knowing this means death, but better death and a short life than an eternity of separation from God and hell. What a mercy that he puts those cherubim to guard, to even guard the garden, to make sure they don't try to sneak back in. Well, you can see why I said these sermons could get long. We could unpack this for days. We could unpack Genesis and just what it means. Let me just highlight a couple things of application. Because doctrine, friends, builds disciples, gives us the truth and the clarity of who God is and how he's made us and what we should do. First observation, we are not the centers of the earth or of the universe. God is. We're not the most important person in our lives. God is, right? In the beginning, God. Then he made us. Two, we bear his image. Whether in Christ or out of Christ, we bear his image. Therefore, we're not surprised when a coworker who is often mean or is maybe a cheater or is known to be immoral uh, does something good. It's not a surprise. He's made in the image of God. And it's not a surprise when, quote, Christians hurt each other and say awful things. It's not a surprise there either because we're fallen image bearers of God. Notice also, and we could unpack this. I'd love to do a sermon on it. God gives us responsibility for his creation. So we're stewards for the king in all that we do in the fields, all that we do at work, how we treat our environment. No, that word is not used in Scripture, but surely if we're called to be good caretakers of God's creation, to be fruitful and multiply, therefore we are to be held accountable at some level for how we treat what God's given us. <clears throat> and men and women have intrinsic value. Though I believe and I teach I think the scriptures teach there's a complementary nature between man and woman. There are differences. There's some that are quite obvious anatomically, but there are also differences in our relationship and what God has called us to do. We are equally made and equally valuable in God's eyes. End of story. No room for bigotry. No room whatsoever. So God creates. God now begins his path towards redemption. God's kicked us out of the garden, if you will. Eden, if you will, is no longer accessible to us. God wants to do something new. And he was not surprised by our choice, by our choice 
in sinning. God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself. Galatians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Galatians chapter 4. Elder Mark shared this with us in his sermon two weeks ago. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Paul, in his letter to the church in Galatia, is reminding both the Jews and the Gentiles who don't know their Old Testament what God has done. In the fullness of time, he sent his son, Jesus, to redeem those. And notice the fruit of that redemption, friends, it's to be adopted back in. We were outside, kicked out of fellowship with God, kicked out of Eden, not allowed to come back in, no longer able to live for eternity, but given the curse of death. And having done several funerals in the last month, it is just obvious to me how while we are not surprised by death, it is always hard because there's something in us that knows we weren't made to die. But it's part of the curse. It's part of the curse. And yet God, in the fullness of time, this means, friends, that God is the greatest author has the greatest epic novel, and you and I who are in Christ have gotten a chance to be a part of it. So I said earlier, if you're not sure where you're at in this Christian faith, if you're kind of struggling with that, then you've picked a great 12 weeks. You've picked a great 12 weeks. Stick with us. Join us. What's the worst? You've taken 12 weeks and you've decided, well, I don't think Jesus is really my, my answer. Okay. Isn't that a better? At least you've tried as opposed to not, and then in eternity realizing I could have, but now my loss is not only, my loss is eternal rather than just 12 weeks of your time. So take Pascal's wager. Stick with us. Seasoned Christian, be encouraged. This is gospel. This is the scriptures. You'll be reminded of some old truths, and knowing how the Spirit works, you'll be shown some new things in God's word. May it deepen. Parents, you and I must disciple our kids and help them know the truths of the scriptures. I'm working on some tools that will help parents in that way, along with um, what they're already doing through our (coughs) Nurture Commission. Galatians chapter 4, in the fullness of time. Why? To make all things new for his glory. God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself, Jesus is the answer to that need for redemption. And what is his purpose? Revelation 21. Turn there if you have your Bibles, or write it down. Revelation 21, verses 5 through 8. Revelation chapter 21, last book in your Bible. (coughs) 5 through 8. And he, this is God, the triune God, who was seated on the throne, said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down. He's speaking this to John. For these words are true, trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will, be, I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son or daughter. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, for the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolatries, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire. that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Friends, we will all die. What we read here is the hope of redemption from what we are due, from what we have inherited from our great, 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 great granddad and grandma, Adam and Eve. We've inherited their rebellious nature. I pray in these weeks to come that this will strengthen your journey or begin your journey of redemption with Jesus. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, whatever I have said that is not helpful, may it blow away like chaff in the wind, like a dusting on the top of the car. Lord, what is true from your scriptures, may it bear fruit. Give us hearts that are soft. Give us ears that hear and eyes that see. And all because you deserve the glory. Our God, our creator, and our redeemer. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.